Well, good morning, church. <laughs> Man, I love hearing your voice in the morning. <laughs> Let's all stand. We're going to sing one of my favorite old hymns, Bless Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with this goodness, lost in his. my story, this is my song, I'm praising my Savior all the day long, and this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Good morning, church. What is it? Do I have something between my teeth? What are y'all staring at? I'm just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to be back. I've been gone a long time, so good to see you. Glad you're all here. Welcome to Anderson Baptist Church. This is your first time. Um, we have a big group of people down in Honduras right now, so a lot of our leaders, like for instance our pastor, Pastor Kyle, is down there, um, and so we don't have our normal pastor, so we have a guest speaker today. Mr. Justin McCoy is going to be bringing the lesson today, so this is very exciting. And if you're unaware, we have a baptism today, so also very excited for that. It's one of our youth. One of our youth at camp asked, uh, you know, said they wanted to have uh, Jesus be the leader of their life. And they gave their heart to him, and she said that she wanted to wait until this weekend. So her family's here today. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait for that. A couple things. We have our women's ministry, if you're familiar, we have put a lot of effort into it, uh, trying to get it kicked off the right way. And so the kickoff for this fall is coming August 27th. Okay, so please, if you want to be a part of that or if you've never been a part of it and want to get into it, the kickoff for this fall is August 27th. And then we also have our blood drive, which is next Sunday. We have some more baptisms next week and we have the blood drive. We do the blood drive twice a year. And sometimes I know Miss Tracy, she's the one that sets it up for us. As it gets closer, we're like, oh my gosh, no one signed up. But we've always had a very successful blood drive. So come next week. Uh, jump on the list. Is the list available online already? So you can go and pick a time now for next Sunday. Um, Kyle will be back bringing the lesson, so probably don't want to set it up during his lesson time or he might get mad at you, but it, that, was, that was a joke. It's okay to laugh. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I'm going to open this with a word of prayer so we can get back to worshiping our Lord and Savior. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you've given us. Uh, you have been so prudent and so giving. Uh, you are our protector, and we are so blessed. And so we want to honor you today by uh, worshiping and praising you, uh, by getting a word given to us today by Brother Justin. We pray that all of this would enter our hearts and, and want us just to proclaim you, not just today, but every day this week. Lord, we pray that you would be with this uh, community, um, continue to help us provide the way you want us to for this community and for its people. Thank you for everything that you've done. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will see all the goodness of God. All my life you've been faithful And all my life you've been so, so good With every breath that I'm able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice yeah, you've led me through the fire, the darkest nights, or close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good With every breath that I'm able I will see all the goodness of God Your goodness is running out It's running after me Your goodness is running out it's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running out It's running after me Your goodness is running out It's running after me Your goodness is running out It's running after me I give you everything. Your goodness is running out. It's running after me. And all my life you've been faithful. And all my life you've been so, so good. With every breath that I made. the goodness of God. And all my life you've been faithful. And all my life you've been so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will see all the goodness of God. Amen.
come to you praising you father we thank you for the time that we get to run to you and you welcome us with open arms father i pray that you'll prepare our hearts for your words in your precious name we pray amen thank you brother ben how is everyone this morning dreading Monday y'all want me to go like two hours long so we don't have to worry about Monday probably not Ooh, get crazy I'm gonna apologize up front uh, I forgot my uh, old man cheaters this morning so when I read the scripture it'll be from my phone don't think I'm trying to do that out of disrespect for the Bible there forgive forgiveness what does this word mean to you? Many of you may be thinking after I mentioned it, along the lines of someone did me wrong and it hurt, or someone hurt my feelings when they said that and I didn't like it. 
And still others among you may be thinking of minor little things. You bump into somebody, say, excuse me, I'm sorry, smile and move on. Or at the opposite end of that spectrum, you may be thinking of deep hurts, deep harm, and deep pain that fell upon you at the hands of someone else. Let's take a minute to look at a secular definition of this word before we move on. In Merriam-Webster, we see that forgive or forgiveness is to cease to feel resentment against or to give up resentment or claim of requital. Now, from a language standpoint, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? You know, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Y'all heard that before? Kids? No? Am I dating myself here? <laughs> or easy as pie? That's one from the older generation. I'm sure we all have some sayings that come to mind when it comes to something being simple and easy. And, by the way, you know you're in a Baptist church when both of our examples reference food. Right? Back to that simple and easy part. For those of us who have been wronged by others, we all know that forgiveness is just not that simple. When someone hurts us, our immediate, our instinctual response, our human response, is to hold a grudge, to feel like we should return that favor. To me, personally, this is one of the struggles that I deal with on a daily basis in my walk with God. Now, I don't know about you or your life experiences in this room, but I can tell you from personal experience about the deep hurt, the sorrow, the pain, and the struggles that the sinful and hurtful actions of others can have on someone. You see, I've been married to a wonderful young woman for 18 years now. Say hi, hon. A young woman who, in her preteens and teens, experienced unthinkable harm to her at the hands of someone else. Repeated harm that should never happen to anyone. Harm that should the church at the time had been being a real church would have stepped in and put an end to. But they didn't. They did nothing to support her. You may be wondering why. And it's because it involved a member of their staff. She alone was left to suffer the lifelong hurt, the pain, depression, and anxiety that such acts can lead to. Even up to the point of having suicidal thoughts. And even more scary than that, plans to carry those out. And that harm and that hurt, it continued into her relationships and eventually into our marriage, affecting not only her interactions with me as her husband, but with her four children as well. And yet here we are, back at those simple words, forgiveness. As a Christian, the expectation is forgiveness. Why? It's in the Bible. Friends, this is heavy stuff. And I apologize for laying it on you so quickly on a Sunday morning. But sadly, the same things that happened to her 
happen more than any of us want to admit still to this day. To way too many very innocent people. Today we're going to spend some time digging into forgiveness from God's perspective. Finding out His heart and His truths on it. And hopefully pointing out the power that He intended with such a simple yet huge act. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come today to open our hearts to you, to worship, Lord, we thank you for this time to sing your praise, to study your word, to fellowship with each other, to lift each other up in your truth, Lord. I pray as we continue this message, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be speaking to each individual heart in this room. Whatever they need to hear from you, let them hear it, Lord. Whatever action they need to take, encourage them in it. We just praise you for this time to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're continuing our series in the parables. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time today, first of all, we're glad you're here. We have been taking a deep dive into the parables recently. Stories that Jesus used to teach his people, and in the case today, specifically teach his disciples. Today our focus is going to be on the parable of the unforgiving servant or the unrepentant servant. The scripture we find this parable in is Matthew chapter 18 and verses 21 through 35. If you have your Bibles with you, please go ahead and turn there now. Today as we study God's word, we're going to break down this parable to, so that we ensure we understand Jesus' teachings. And then, we're going to dig a little deeper, looking into some very important things, things that are often overlooked as we read through the Scriptures quickly in our daily hurries. We will consider these four major points that I would like for us to gather from this parable. First, God forgives, and it's big forgiveness. Second, seeking his grace is a one-time thing, but seeking his forgiveness is not. Third, if we can't give grace, then we don't get it from him. And fourth, we cannot pay our sin debt to God. Follow along with me as we go through the passage today, please. Verse 21, Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him that debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw that he, what had happened, 
They were deeply grieved and came and responded to their Lord, or reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father also, or will also, do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. I do want to mention uh, that many scholars believe that the verses leading up to this parable are good teachings on church discipline. So that kind of sets the stage for you here as we roll into this parable. The parable we have read is in response to a question that Peter had asked of Jesus. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus responds, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. We need to pause here and discuss this magnitude for a minute. We can think that Peter was just pulling that number of seven from out of thin air in this question. However, there's some Old Testament scripture that he might have been considering. In Amos chapter 1, verses 3 through 13, God repeatedly forgives three times on offenses. But on the fourth, he pours out his wrath. We must wonder if Peter is going for a big effect in this situation, basically doubling that number of three. And even more importantly, we must wonder if Jesus is saying that the new number of times is actually 490. Do that that many times, and on 491, you're off the hook. Is that what he's saying here? Not what he's saying at all. Jesus is using this outrageous inflation of Peter's number of times of forgiveness as a shock factor to his disciples, something to really drive home his point. Guys in the room, you understand this. Many of us have heard your trophy fish and trophy book stories. Ladies, I'm not super familiar with exaggeration stories that y'all use, but... I bet y'all can think of some as well. So why the shock factor? Jesus is seen throughout scriptures, quote unquote, going big or going home. Have y'all heard that before? Quite a bit. When he uses magnitude, we can rest assured that this is a big moment to him for teaching. So let's continue. We see something significant in the first servant that is confronted by the king. He owes 10,000 talents. Anybody know how much that is? We'll find out shortly. Now, the Bible doesn't specify in here if this is gold or silver or what it is as far as the currency goes. But as a single reference, when we look at Exodus chapter 28, verse 34, only 29 talents of gold were used for the construction of the first tabernacle. And here, this person owes 10,000. And we all know when we read the scriptures how much they like gold in the tabernacle there. Based on what I can find, an Old Testament talent is roughly 75 pounds. So, even if that was silver, a cheaper metal, let me do some math here for you. That is $240 million in today's money if you consider silver at $20 an ounce. Some of you are checking my math out there, aren't you? Engineers in the room. You could imagine if we switch that to gold that's worth more than $1,900 an ounce. 
I think it's important here for us to understand that this is way more than a lifetime of wages for this servant. Some commentaries say it's multiple. All that said, this is an unpayable debt by this servant. He could work a lifetime and never pay it off. And yet the king, when the servant pleads with him, forgives it. Just like that. Now I want you to keep in mind here for something later that the king was ready to sell the servant and his family and all the servant owned to recoup that debt. Friends, that king in this parable is God. And that servant, that's us. We owe an insurmountable debt to God for our sin. And yet, as we plead to him for forgiveness and show repentance, he responds in loving, love and grace by forgiving that sin debt. This part of the parable is our big picture of God's big forgiveness. A lifetime of wages willing to be forgiven. That's a big thing, right? A lifetime of sin forgiven. That's even bigger. Our sin debt to God is much, much, much more than we could ever repay. Yet God is willing to to forgive it, every bit of it. And friends, His grace is there for the asking. As we began today, I promised you a deep dive into this parable, so let's keep digging a little deeper here. When we seek God and we ask for His grace, He gives it. That is our seeking and receiving His salvation. However, and this is a really big however, and many times we don't like to admit it, we still stumble and sin daily. So, are we to just shrug our shoulders and say, oh well, I'm saved, you know, check that box. That's not the answer at all. We must, we must go back to him when we sin. We must show repentance, true repentance, each time we fail him. And, and, take note of this, the more we must go back to him, the more we should question ourselves is His grace really changing us? The answer to that question should be crystal clear. His grace should be changing us. And if it's not, we've got some work to do on that relationship. My point is this. This one servant had to plead for mercy on his debt. How many times? Once. One time. And that was the end of the pleading that we read about and see in this parable. We will find out as we move along that that servant does face his king again, though. And that next time, the outcome, it's not so good for that servant. It's his judgment. Now, let's move to the next bit of the story. The parable quickly shifts to the servant who was forgiven the large debt. And now we find him going to a servant who owes him a debt. And what does he do? Well, he demands the servant give him what is owed to him. Sound familiar? Just like the first part of the parable. And the measly little sum of a hundred denarii. You may be asking why the shift in the money here. It's again for effect. That 10,000 talents that's a lifetime of debt, 
This hundred denarii is thought to be a couple of days' wages. Not very large at all. Yet, the forgiven servant, we see violently attacking him, demanding payback. And when the servant responds just like the forgiven servant did to the king, something changes. We see a different reaction. The forgiven servant refuses to forgive that small debt, sending him to prison and, get this now, prison where he cannot even work to repay that debt. So what are we seeing here? Jesus is painting a picture here of someone who just had an enormous, an enormous amount of grace given to him. Yet he cannot see fit to show even a small amount of grace to his fellow servant. We like to think we cannot fathom this train of thought personally. But trust me, there are those who when grace is shown could care less about returning that to others. You don't believe me? Next time you're in a room full of toddlers and not enough toys to satisfy each one of them, watch them. And this is the hard part. When you watch them, think about some adults you've seen or experienced in your life who act just the same. We're seeing someone showed with or showered with overwhelming grace refusing to give a small portion of grace to others. What the forgiven servant is failing to realize here is he received grace abundantly. And yet, he is selfishly withholding that from others. We will wrap this up fully as we continue. But I want to take a minute here just to state something obvious, as much as it hurts. Friends, we cannot receive grace if we cannot give it. We cannot be forgiven if we are not willing to forgive. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, Justin. You said God's grace was there for us whenever we wanted it. And you would be correct. But that grace... As we mentioned earlier, expect something in return. Repentance. And it's clear here that the forgiven servant is not repentant at all about what got him into that debt originally. And he shows this in how he treats a fellow servant. And then what? Well... Let's just say someone found out about this situation. There were witnesses. We read that the people were deeply grieved. Doesn't this sound like a human thing? We love to shower others with empathy and caring. When they're hurting, when they're harmed, when they've been mistreated. And we often comfort them and tell them, what? It'll be okay. And as a Christian, we mention that we must forgive. And we do this without realizing the full weight of their experience. It's just something we do. As we continue in the parable, the people tell the king of what happened. And this is where we see the forgiven servant called back to the king. Called back to face a judgment for his actions. Look back at verse 32 with me. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. What does the Lord call him here? 
wicked servant. And then what does he do? He reminds him of what he has done for him with his grace. And why did he do that? Because? Because that servant pleaded with him. He sought his forgiveness. Now, look at verse 33 with me. And you should not, or excuse me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. What does he hit him with next? Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow servant slave? How? In the same way that I had mercy on you. Allow me to translate this into some modern terms. You moron. You just don't get it. You begged me for something you wanted. Something you needed. Something to change your life. And then, when I granted it, you could not even share that same grace with your fellow sinner. Now, that was a bit exaggerated on my part, but it's exactly what was going on here. Jesus is using this parable to ensure his disciples really understand a few things. We are all in need of forgiveness of that sin debt. And we cannot fully receive his grace unless we are willing to show God's grace, forgiveness to others, to our fellow sinners. Now the really sad part, verses 34 and 35. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Verse 34 tells us he is moved with anger. So what's he angry about? The servant he has forgiven is not showing that same heart to others. His lesson in forgiveness to this servant was not absorbed at all. Friends, if y'all get a chance this week, dig into 1 John. And look at how often John refers to God's love for us, our love for our brothers and sisters, how our love for others reflects God's love and how we can't show others who he is without showing love. Now, a lot of us don't like this kind of homework, but I promise you, if you leave here wondering about what that forgiving servant did wrong today, you will fully understand it after reading 1 John. And get this, that's just one book from the Apostles. Imagine what we can find elsewhere. Verse 34 drives it home hard. I'm going to read it again. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. We see the parable close with the following, the Lord's judgment for that wicked slave. What is his judgment? to be with the jailers in some version, torturers and others. For how long? Until he could repay the original debt, that insurmountable debt. Friends, he's going to be with those torturers forever. I'm hoping that you notice something here as well, something that caught my attention. The family and the belongings were left out of this punishment and this judgment. Only the sinner was sent to be tortured. Now, I don't want you thinking there are no consequences of sin 
on others around the sinner. Friends, an individual's sin has domino effects. It's not just one thing. It falls out and it hurts those around those people that are sinning. This is a sad reality. But this is a picture of God condemning this servant, this sinner. To judgment for this servant or this sinner's actions. For our final deeper dive point, we cannot pay our sin debt. I must ask a serious and tough question of each one of you in this room. Please don't blurt out the answers. Friends, if you had to stand before God today and tell him about some of even the minor sinful things that you have done, could you look him in the eye and tell him you're sorry? Or would you be like me and many others bowing face down on the ground, trembling in fear and shame because of just one of the many things that you did against him? Now add that up to many. Friends, our sin debt to him we can't repay it. Never repay it. Not by works, actions, service, anything. That sin debt had to be paid by him. By sending his son to take all of our sin. And all of his wrath for that sin. And to die on that cross to cover it for us to take that sin to the grave with him and bury it there forever. To rise again on the third day so that we could humbly seek him. To accept that sin-covering grace. To spend eternity with him. I'd like to close today by going back to the story of my lovely wife. Friends, we were 13 years into our marriage when she finally, finally had enough courage to come to me. She was crying in agony as she recounted all of the evil things that had happened to her. Fully expecting a response of rage to the person that had inflicted that evil upon her only to get a completely different response a response of we've got to pray we must pray here together and you must forgive him we must forgive him and friends, pray we did. Pray again. Pray some more. Guess what? We still pray today about these things. And we cried together. And we cried some more. Guess what? We still cry today about these things. But you know what? I saw an immediate, an immediate change in her. A heavy weight lifted off of her shoulders. Nightmares that she had had almost daily for years just disappeared. Please allow me to say here that I'm thankful for those nightmares going away as well. Mostly for her sake but a little for mine as well. And by the way, this is not meant to be any kind of a selfish part of a story. But it's more a focus on the struggles 
struggles that a lack of forgiveness can bring to your life and your loved one's life. You see, over the years, that harm and that evil inflicted upon her, the harm behind those nightmares being relived over and over and over, they caused her to have violent defense responses in her sleep. And those violent responses, many times, I bore the brunt of that defense. Suffering from some serious punches to the face, a lot of them to the gut, or wherever else her arms were flailing in defense of those nightmares that were torturing. Friends, as we prayed together for that forgiveness, God stepped in and he ceased and eased that pain there on the spot. He took away those horrible nightmares from her and he gave her a peace that she never thought attainable after facing such horrible things. Forgiveness easy to say, oftentimes very hard to do. But God promises us that if we do as he asks, just like in this parable today, show grace to others as he shows it to us, he is there. I watched years of a lack of forgiveness wreak havoc on my wife and in turn on our family. And when she finally found it in her heart to forgive, just like this parable tells us from the heart, God was right there. He was in that moment ready to lift her up out of that horrible path set her in a more loving path. Friends, are you holding on to some pain today? Are you out there thinking there's just no way I can forgive what that person did to me? Jesus tells us here in this parable, friends, his Holy Spirit is speaking to each one of you individually today, saying, Forgive as I forgave you. Are you ready? Are you willing to take that step? It's not easy. The Bible never tells us it's easy. And many times we like to ask, how? How can we forgive? Well, all we have to focus on in the Bible is from the heart. Simple little words at the end of a parable. I can't spell out the details of what Wendy went through in this room today. It's not for younger ears to hear about. But let's just say and settle on the fact that it was pure evil. Someone else's sin causing evil on her. And not just once, repeated over years. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, I don't know if I could ever forgive that. And that's a good human thought to have. But I want to witness to you today. She struggled for many years without forgiving. And I can personally tell you about the change after she finally came to that choice. I don't know where she found the courage or how she did it. If I were in her shoes, I may not have been able to. But she did. From the heart, just like Jesus 
is teaching us here in this parable today. She didn't have to track this person down. She didn't have to get face to face with them. She didn't have to call them. She did not even have to worry what they had to say or think about it. She simply had to forgive it in her heart. We'll open up for a time of invitation as we close here, and I want to let you know, you have not done the forgivable. None of us have accumulated too much sin debt. None of us have strayed too far to turn back to Him, to seek Him. And when you do, friends, when you do, He will meet you there with wide open arms and shower you with His everlasting grace. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time together, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in closing as uh, we're going to witness a baptism of a young heart that has been turned over to you. We're so thankful for that. We ask your blessings upon that person and their journey with you. And that all goes back to these words that we have studied today about forgiveness, your expectations, and what that means to us. God, I pray that your words today through your Holy Spirit are touching hearts in this room. Those that are not willing to forgive, Lord, that they would see fit to just do as you ask. Lord, I pray your special help upon them as I know these burdens are hard and heavy. God, as we close today, Lord, we just thank you again for this time here, for your presence here. We pray your protective hand upon us throughout this week, Lord, and more importantly, Lord, we pray that these words would ring true in our lives so that we could show your love, your grace to those who need to see it in us. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Please be seated. Hey, buddy. <laughs> As I mentioned in prayer earlier, we got a special event this morning. Miss Connor Ellis, where you at? Putting you on the spot. Hi. We get to witness a baptism this morning, and the Novosads are going to handle that for us. So please give them your attention. Hello. You can hear me. All right. Did you say yep? <laughs> We have Carson here, and if you don't know her, you're going to have to get to know her. She has a heart of gold. Hey, you can walk in the water, and I'll talk in the water. I love that. <laughs> All right, Carson, she has a heart of gold. She gives the best hugs. She makes you feel loved and special, and she, she's just very genuine soul, um, which is, makes God is going to want to use her to further his kingdom. Um, she's been here over a little a year, and one of the first moments of her, I've known her for a while because of kids' sports and stuff. Oh, youth, she wanted y'all to come stand by her. Come on. Because <laughs> um, she loves y'all. Anyways, there was one time during invitation, she came up to me, and I promise you, I think it's one of the first times she felt the over-loving overwhelming joy of Jesus Christ in her. And the Holy Spirit was really speaking through her. Um, all she could do was nothing. She couldn't even speak. She just cried and cried. They're coming. Hold on. And they're coming. You're here. Um, but she just cried, and she didn't know what she wanted me to pray for. Hey, also her parents can see. Y'all just sit on the floor like these friends. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we prayed for everything, family, friends, her walk with God. We just prayed for everything. And since then, God has placed many people in her life, from her family loving on her, her leaders in the church, her leaders at school, um, to all the friends here, and place them in her life to put spiritual seeds in her. And they have grown and grown and grown. And I think at church camp, those seeds blossom, and that's when she realized she wanted to surrender her life to Jesus Christ. Um, it was a beautiful thing. Um, I can't wait to see what God is going to do with you. It's going to be beautiful. So she... Oh, that would be great. Okay. Can you hear me? You got to spit it up. Okay, okay. Anyways. Um, but then, you know, she asked Jesus into her heart this summer, or this during church camp, and then she was ready to be baptized when she got home in front of all you, in front of all your friends and all her, her family members, um, which family, y'all can come here too, but give them all hugs. But anyways, um, as all of us, we pray for you each and every day for your walk, but the best thing is that you know the way, you know the truth, and you're going to walk towards him always, all right? Um, one of the leaders that really made an impact on her was she's not here, but she did ask if Anna can baptize her, which is a huge blessing, and then Anna just wants to also congratulate you, and she loves you dearly. Um, Anna had to go back to school, so I, I got two, so, which was selfishly exciting. Anyways, um, so with all that said, uh, Carson, do you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? All right. With that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. Sorry. All right. There you go. Woo! Jennifer lost her mic there, but if you want to take some time to give hugs and stuff, you are free to do so. You are dismissed. Make sure you show God's love to somebody this week.